Welcome to KC Cares, Kansas City's nonprofit digital voice, telling the stories of Kansas City nonprofits and the people behind them. I'm Ruth Baum Biggis. KC Cares is proudly sponsored by the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation, and we are pleased to be bringing you this podcast from Spark KC, Kansas City's new co-working space, and it is really, really cool. I am sitting in what I would call the family room lounge. I don't know if that's the official title of it, but there's a fireplace behind me that would go on if it was a little colder with very comfortable seating. They have lounges, they have kitchen, they have offices, they have conference rooms. Fabulous, fabulous space. They will work with organizations for events. So nonprofits, check them out. We're so grateful that they've allowed us to come into this space. And joining us in this really cool space, but safely distance, is Claire Bishop. She is the executive director of the American Public Square. Welcome, Claire, from another farther away spot. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I'm really thrilled to be here this morning. Well, we're glad to have you. And, and Claire is in a really cool space too. They've got hanging chairs, but we didn't want her to have to swing back and forth uh, for our conversation. So Claire, we're so glad you could come out safely distanced and share with us everything that American Public Square is about. Let's just open the floor. Sounds like a square, sounds American. What is the purpose and the mission of American Public Square? Great. Well, thank you again for allowing us the opportunity to join your podcast today. I know you do a lot of great work in the community featuring the work of local nonprofits. So American Public Square is just thrilled to be counted among them, uh, among the group of people who are doing important work in the Kansas City community. American Public Square was founded in 2013 by former ambassador to Portugal under Barack Obama, Alan Katz, to address what he perceived as the growing political divide in our nation. Uh, our mission is to bring together non-like-minded individuals for civil fact-based discourse um, and through those conversations to identify pathways to actionable common ground on contentious issues that plague our community. So we bring people together uh, with the intent of disagreeing not less necessarily, but better with one another. We don't believe that everyone should be of the same mind on these important issues that, that uh, present themselves to our community and our society as a whole. Um, but we think that we could probably be better about uh, disagreeing with one another in a productive way, particularly even since the time we were founded in 2013, it's been seven short years ago. Uh, I think the, the chasm between Americans has continued to increase. And today in 2020, uh, the, the need for uh, an improved tone and quality in our public discourse is probably more urgent now uh, than it ha ever has been, or at least in my lifetime. You mentioned one word in your description that I thought was interesting, and I hope it, I grabbed it correctly, non-like-minded? Correct. Individuals coming to, the, uh, to me that's fascinating because usually when you're in a room, you, you tend to seek out those that are like-minded. And that's not really what you're looking for. Correct. Uh, actually, yes. So uh, our, our changing world uh, with the increasing uh, technology, the 24-hour news cycle, social media, enable us, if we wish, to uh, preserve our bubble of like-minded individuals. And if we so does, and we tend to, to move into neighborhoods where people think and act and, and look like us, and if we wish to, we can just spend all of our time around people who agree with us and never challenge any of the beliefs that we hold uh, dear. So an important part about what American Public Square brings to the table is actively seeking diverse perspectives and creating space uh, for those uh, perspectives to be shared in a, in a respectful way, uh, in, a, in a caring way um, to, to strengthen uh, those ideas. And a lot of times, you know, I think sometimes we get uh, pushback. It says, well, you know, you're trying to change people's minds. 
Not exactly, no. In fact, that's that's not our objective in, in convening people of non-like minds to change anyone's perspective. We hope through that process to open minds uh, and to engage people in the kinds of conversations that enable them to think more broadly about their own perspective and maybe even know their own perspective better. Um, a, a, a thought leader that I'm a huge fan of, a man by the name of Arthur Brooks, who uh, was the former head of the American Enterprise Institute and is now at the Kennedy Center at Harvard says, and I think I, I mentioned this earlier, uh, it's really not about disagreeing less with one another, but disagreeing better. Um, collectively as a society, I believe very much that we've sort of let those um, muscles um, get a little weak. So we need to do some uh, strength training, some focused exercises, uh, if you will, to help strengthen those muscles again and enable us to come to the table with the people uh, who aren't bad people. Uh, they just so happen to share a different opinion than we do. Um, and and uh, the, the increased polarization, the decreased ability to do that as a society has really detrimental impacts uh, on our community, on our society, and on our democracy. So American Public Square lives in this space, uh, which can often be quite uncomfortable, actually, uh, to help strengthen those muscles, strengthen our democracy, and strengthen the bonds that tie us together as a community. Oh, I love several words that you dropped within that explanation. Engagement, uh, strengthening muscles that maybe we have gotten lazy with, um, and not really wanting to change one's mind, but opening minds to that it's okay that there's another side. You don't have to agree with it, but there's always other alternatives and being mindful in the space as we try to move forward and solve issues. Give us an example of some of the things that APS does to try to make these things happen. Sure. Uh, so, our, you know, our signature programs are typically moderated panels that bring together uh, individuals representing diverse perspectives. And we'll hold those types of programs multiple times throughout the year. Uh, although at the moment, all of those are being done virtually. Uh, when we're able to, most of those programs are held in person uh, where people can look one another in the eye and take personal accountability for the perspectives that they share, which also happens to help uh, with the with the civility quotient, um, especially on particularly contentious issues. I'd like to draw out uh, specific attention to some work that we've expanded in 2020 uh, around our student initiative. So, you know, we believe that people of all ages can benefit from learning to disagree not less but better with one another, um, but particularly young people. Um, and in, in 2020, uh, it's, it's unfortunate, but the uh, role that civics and governmental education plays in your typical high schooler's career has been diminished from two full years of uh, standards that, that cover things from uh, voting and civic engagement and um, active uh, efforts throughout the community of all different kinds, uh, really the, the sort of the civic DNA of our country, all of that has been compressed over the last 40 years into one solitary semester of civic education for your standard high schooler. Um, we believe that our young people, especially because they have come of age in a time where they are coming of age in a time where all of these factors that I mentioned at the beginning, including the preponderance of digital and social media, um, the sort of um, interest speed. You know, if you ever notice when you go to a, a website where you read about the news, a lot of times they have a recommendation engine at the bottom. Well, if you like this, it's kind of like Amazon. You like this, well, you might like this too. So it makes it really easy to just kind of follow the path that's based on what you've said or, or the actions that you've taken. Um, so for young people who are coming of age in that environment, we feel it's especially critical to help strengthen these muscles of active listening, of, uh, of sharing in empathy with those who disagree, uh, and of, of uh, learning how to research and uncover fact-based information uh, with the preponderance of uh, the term fake news. Fake news, you see a lot of 
um, <laughs> people who get, you know, they read the, the clickbait and uh, the headlines that are, are crafted to, um, to catch your attention, to raise your blood pressure. And that's become sort of the sati satiation of our society. So with our expanded student initiative, we actually have a sort of three prongs of that program. We do it at the college level and at the high school level. Uh, we have a full intern cohort every fall, summer, and spring semester. And those interns come together to form a, first of all, they do all kinds of incredible work on behalf of the organization and expand our capacity in ways that are truly needed. So that's one component of our student initiative. And that's really grown this year. The second is bringing those interns at the college level together with other interested students from around the metropolitan area to form a student-led committee uh, that then has the responsibility to develop and produce a student-led program, APS style program. So they get to choose uh, the topic uh, of most interest to them. They do all the work in terms of sourcing expert panelists and uh, event planning and promotion. So it gives students at the college level really hands-on opportunity to, uh, to produce programming and, and engage their own voices. Because I think that's something also that's really important is giving young people agency. The last component of it at the high school level uh, involves in-classroom based learning. And this semester we'll be doing much of that virtually because that's just the situation that we're in. Uh, the first semester includes three different uh, in-class activities that help develop these skills and strengthen these muscles of discourse. Uh, and then the following semester allows the students the same opportunity to produce student-led programming on a topic of their choosing. So again, when our education system System tends to foster and support more passive learning, uh, memorization, testing. Uh, we really want to step in. We feel that nonprofit organizations such as ours have the capacity to uh, enhance uh, what's being done in, the, in education by uh, offering more project-based and active learning opportunities such as what I've described. So that's a great example of how we're working very actively in the community, uh, particularly among young people, to, to help people understand, first of all, why it's really important to be able to do this, why this skill is needed, especially in today's society, and also give them the practical tools and know-how to apply it and, and make it happen. Well, as somebody who trained in education a, a long time ago, uh, but in that area, and then having watched my own children, I have watched that go by the wayside. And I, we applaud you for taking that on and including youth in the overall efforts of what you're doing. You alluded to how everything is now having to be virtual. Let's, you know, let's throw it out there. We're still in this COVID world and having to work remotely or at least greatly distanced. Uh, how did APS go about dealing with the pandemic? And are there any little secrets you can share that might help other nonprofits? Well, you know, I consider us to be very fortunate to have a team that has adapted masterfully to this new digital environment. And for an organization such as ours that uh, whose mission is predicated upon bringing people together in person, convening people in person, we truly did have to make a remarkable pivot uh, at the time back in, in March of 2020 when all of, um, all of the, the public events uh, began to get canceled and, um, and really everything moved into the virtual environment. So uh, the first thing we did was you know, uh, identify a, a technology platform that could support virtual programming. Um, I will say we, we have done a number of different programs. We started a podcast uh, in April with our founder, Ambassador Alan Katz, and our advisory board co-chair, Mike McShane. They happen to exist on different sides of the political spectrum, and they're also of different ages and backgrounds. And so it's kind of interesting. Uh, we get them together on a biweekly basis to talk about issues of uh, local and national importance. A lot of times it focuses on politics, um, but sometimes just, just local issues of interest to the community, and they'll bring guests on. So that was one way that we adapted. And, and people can uh, listen to podcasts in a more on-demand uh, setting, which 
which as you all know here at Casey Cares, you probably have a lot of listeners or viewers who aren't tuning in live, but tune in after the fact while they're uh, on a walk at the park or, or driving to uh, get groceries. So we made the intentional decision to create uh, a more sort of broad-based menu of programming that enables more of this virtual and on-demand consumption. So while many of our programs still take place in a live environment, um, we have noticed that much of uh, the, the growth that we've seen over the last six months or so has been in sort of post-event viewing and on-demand viewing. Uh, so, so in addition to building out more programming that can be consumed and engaged with in that way, we're also in the process of building out what I call, I like to refer to as a, a virtual content hub on American Public Square's website. So in addition to uh, putting together these programs uh, with, with thought leaders and experts and framing the questions and, and putting together sort of all the technology to bring these programs into people's living rooms. We also uh, work with the William T. Kemper Foundation and the Kansas City Public Library in many cases uh, to develop fact sheets in advance of our programs. Um, so that along with the podcast, along with videos of the programs uh, after they've been released uh, are all available for on-demand consumption in this uh, hub that we call at the square. So you can, uh, you can be at the square uh, in your living room. And, and that actually, although it was uh, sort of uh, the reason it happened was because of uh, you know, the changes with COVID, it was actually something that, that we probably needed to do anyway. We had been looking for ways, you know, my background is in uh, digital uh, media marketing, and we had been looking for ways to expand our digital offerings. Um, because another great event, and I promise I'll stop after this, but this is just such a rich question with so many uh, uh, important points. Um, you're you're another, good. Don't okay. worry, you're good. You, you said this is a casual conversation. I think you know about me at this point that, you know, I'll, I'll take it and run with it. Um, so I appreciate you uh, indulging me. One of the other important side effects of um, this new environment is that we've been able to draw people from all over the country. So uh, while in the past, uh, an in-person program, although we would video those programs, we would record them and, and make those recordings available later, um, even when they were in person, now with a, a live uh, virtual event, people can tune in from around the country and, and around the world. And we've seen more and more of that taking place. So that's been an unintended side effect and a welcome side effect as we grow our reach among organizations um, that are in and American Public Square falls into this category of what are referred to as healthy self-governance movements. And, and we're uh, one of these organizations that support um, strengthening and, and building a healthy self-governance model. I think that you've made an amazing pivot with everything that you have to offer. And that's great that it's allowing you to see growth when everybody seems to be, you know, carrying around this hundred pound backpack that we just keep carrying and carrying for a while with, you know, potentially no end in sight, you know, within the next, you know, several months. We're talking with Claire Bishop, American Public Square. You can go learn about all the programming at www.americanpublicsquare.org. I would encourage our, our listeners and our viewers to check out everything that you all are doing. I wanted to talk a little bit. You have a huge program coming up with some rather interesting guests. Tell us a little bit about your uh, signature fundraising event, your evening at the square, a little different this year. Yes, absolutely. So this year for our annual fundraiser, Evening at the Square, we are hosting a group called the Lincoln Project. And the Lincoln Project is widely recognized as a group of uh, Republicans who have bucked the party trend to back the Biden-Harris presidential ticket in 2020. Um, I have to be honest, we've received a lot of feedback about this event. And in, in many cases, we've heard from people, you know, disappointed that you would, uh, for a nonpartisan and expressly nonpartisan organization, which is what we are, that you would host uh, a, a clearly partisan group for this event. 
I, I want to address that directly and head on because it's so important to who we are. Um, our decision to bring the Lincoln Project in for this event is really based on the fact that they have made a conscious decision to put country before party um, and to transcend sort of their partisan identity in order to follow principles. We won't be talking at this event about, um, about uh, their, their position, which is decidedly uh, not uh, in favor of President Trump, uh, as much as we'll be focusing on what it's like, what, what partisan politics are doing to our society, what, what um, the, the dangers of engaging in just a straight partisan identity can be, uh, and what it's like to transcend those things um, and to, to make a, a conscious decision to change your mind. And I think that that's something that, you know, in, in today's political system, uh, that, that the strength that's inherent in uh, being willing and able to change your mind has been truly lost. You know, as a society, our leaders have lost humility and uh, the ability to say, you know, this is, um, this is what I believe, and this is what I'm gonna what I'm gonna stand up for. So that's gonna be the nature of our discussion with founders of the Lincoln Project on uh, in October of this year. Uh, we're really excited to have it, um, and I have to say also, you know, our typical programs, as I mentioned, are moderated panel discussions where we bring in people of of different perspectives to have a sort of a civil and fact based dialogue. Our evening at the Square fundraiser uh, is really intended to provide a behind the scenes look at nationally recognized speakers and, and influential people. So this isn't our typical format um, for an APS event. And, uh, and I, I want people to understand that. And I really do think that um, this discussion that we'll be having with the Lincoln Project aligns so perfectly with who we are as an organization, where we exist in this uncomfortable space that can't really be buttressed by the, the deep sort of paths the, that have been eroded um, by our beliefs. You know, sometimes uh, it's required uh, from a person uh, as they're reflecting individually to uh, to really honestly and critically question that. And that's what we'll be doing with this program. I'm really thrilled to be able to host uh, Founders of the Lincoln Project and anyone who might be interested in attending. It's sure to be an engaging and uh, spirited discussion. Um, you can find out more about tickets and sponsorships, which are available at AmericanPublicSquare.org. And it's October 13th, in case anybody wants to know the exact date, but go to the website. I wanna make sure that we address one key thing. You're talking about bringing people to the square. So how does the quote participant who attends an APS event, what role do they have? Do they have an opportunity to raise their voice or opinion or be part of that discussion? So we have a number of different ways and our signature events uh, that are being held virtually now, uh, there's always a, um, a fact checker present, a live fact checker that's often a research librarian or some other a professional researcher. Uh, guests uh, and attendees are welcome at any time to uh, request a fact check on anything that's being said. We also have a roving reporter. Uh, that person uh, receives questions from the audience. When we're doing these uh, programs in person, we actually hand out with the program for the evening cards that say fact check or a question and uh, the roving reporter comes around to the crowd and impulses out. They now happen through a chat feature in the virtual environment, but those are two ways where uh, our, our attendees can engage. I will say that, that most of our events are free and open to the public. Um, so people from around the community and really around the nation are welcome and encouraged to attend and participate. Um, we also have a very active membership base. So American Public Square is a membership organization. We're supported by annual memberships from 
people who feel uh, really uh, that they share values uh, with our organization and uh, support our mission to improve the tone and quality of discourse. So members are um, uh, given, you know, opportunities to register for member exclusive events um, where they can talk, uh, you know, specifically with uh, political strategists and other speakers of note and engage with them in a, in a personal setting. Um, and additionally, uh, we welcome and appreciate feedback from community members at large. Uh, so, uh, and often we receive it. So there's a, a feedback <laughs> function on our website. Um, you can always reach me at Claire at AmericanPublicSquare.org. And we respond when we get comments and questions. And we have, again, we have not only our membership base who happen to be very active and engaged with our programming, uh, but the community at large. These are people who care about their community. They care about having a role and they have a voice and they wish that voice to be heard. And we believe very much that American Public Square should be a forum where that where that takes place. I want to take a quick moment just to um, pivot. I'm not sure if we'll we'll get to this. I don't mean to cut off the next question that you might ask me. But one of the things that we haven't talked about is uh, the fact that we are now uh, formally known as American Public Square at Jewel. And that is uh, our, that's representative of our formal affiliation uh, with William Jewell College in Liberty, Missouri. And as uh, the college known as the critical thinking college, um, William Jewell really provides the perfect academic home for the work that we do. Uh, we work with their faculty and students and the Jewell community at large on producing programs. Uh, they've been a tremendous partner. Uh, and I just wanted to, I didn't want to neglect to mention that because we've been referring to ourselves as American Public Square in this program. And actually we're American Public Square, proudly American Public Square at Jewell now. We have an office there on the Jewell campus in Liberty uh, and our primary headquarters are here in Midtown Kansas City. I was remiss not to add that. So it is American Public Square at Jewel, and, and what a great affiliation for your organization. In just the few minutes that we have left, I like to ask nonprofits, given the difficulties of our times in many ways, what is maybe the greatest challenge you face and have you figured out how to address it? <laughs> Nothing like stumping the conversation, right? Well, listen, uh, you know, I think today the greatest challenge we face is that the momentum uh, that is fed uh, in virtually every direction in our society is toward division. Uh, you see that evident in every media outlet, in the way we spend our free time, in the way our, our neighborhoods are being segregated, in the way um, our sports are being consumed. Um, there, it seems, and again, I'm going to quote Arthur Brooks, again, uh, uh, someone who I admire greatly. He refers to something called the outrage industrial complex. And um, that is to say that there are people um, who, who stand to profit from keeping Americans divided. And uh, this hurts my heart to see, uh, quite honestly. And some, you know, I get out of bed every day as an optimist thinking I'm gonna do whatever I can do today to, uh, to improve this situation for our community. Um, sometimes I wake up and I feel a little discouraged by the fact that it seems that so many influential people, um, people I admire, people who I have thought of as, as principled and compassionate are, um, are not, doing enough to mend the divide and and help us recognize that you know we are a human race and we are all connected through humanity american public square has has three values that that we live by that's um civility because ultimately being kind to one another is really important we're all connected um, honesty uh, even when it's uncomfortable and oftentimes it is if we're being truly honest and lastly, action, um, because every single one of us has not only the right to live in this uh, society that we have built, but we have the responsibility to do things in our daily lives that help 
you know, bring the world uh, to a better place and and not to a worse one. And and you know, I would call there's another organization that does similar work to ours called Braver Angels. They used to be called Better Angels. And I often think about uh, that quote uh, from Abraham Lincoln, which I don't have memorized, so I will not use. But uh, we really need to tap into the better angels of our nature and find ways to connect with one another. Because just because a person doesn't share your beliefs or your opinions doesn't make them a bad or evil person. And we've become increasingly willing to subscribe to the notion that it does in our society. And I'd like to see that change. Well, I think that's an incredible uh, point to move everybody toward and it's American Public Square and we're so grateful that you are here and available. Check the organization out, get into the conversation, whether it's diverse or not, it can be civil and we can move that paradigm forward. Claire, thank you for everything that you and APS is doing in our community. And to be a guest on Casey Cares, like Claire, or underwriting opportunities. If you like what we're doing, please visit caseycaresonline.org. And you can spread the love. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter at Casey Cares Radio and on Instagram at Casey Cares Online. We want to thank Spark KC for hosting us today. It's been great to be here. We'll be back with them. And we want to thank you for listening to Casey Cares. <laughs>